Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. How was everybody this morning? Great. First thing I did when I woke up this morning is looked at the clock and saw that it was pushing seven o'clock. So I had to pray for Pastor Mark as he left this morning at seven from Tampa. Two days of driving. Oh, at seven. <laughs> Believe it. He's a little on the punctual side, so yep. Yep. we're glad that uh, he is on his way and pray for safe travel for him. Thank you. For those of you that are online, welcome. Uh, please go ahead and just say hi in, in the comments there. Let us know you're here uh, so that we can know who's all worshiping with us today. So we've got a few announcements coming up. This Wednesday night, we continue our Lenten series by Mexicano in the Footsteps of the Savior. Um, it's a challenging read. Uh, we're going to be going through some more of that this morning as we get into following Jesus in your storms after hearing uh, following Jesus when you doubt last week with Pastor Mark. And so we look forward to uh, hearing what Max has to say for us, uh, kind of going deeper into what we're going to hear today. And he'll be doing that uh, in his backdrop will actually be in the Sea of Galilee which will be part of what we're talking about today. So we look forward to having you uh, join us for that. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, then on Saturday, very quickly, we come up with our second race of the Orange Track Racing season. Uh, we'll be starting at 9.30 with registration and then racing at, eh, we say approximately, we used to say 10 o'clock, sure. Now it's kind of approximate because if people are kind of wondering afterwards, we're not going to tell them no. And then coming March 18th, uh, we will be doing Grace Street Cinema. So Saturdays, boom, boom, boom. Yesterday we had our men's breakfast. This next Saturday is uh, racing, and then we'll have the movie on the 18th. I do have to talk to Mark because when I went to go start posting some things about the movie we had decided on, we found out that it actually requires a separate license from our uh, CBL license. So. Uh, we're going to have to talk about that real quick, uh, and if that's something that we decide to do, we will be doing that. And we'll make an announcement as quickly as possible on that. Uh, then, instead of men's breakfast, well, hang on, I got something else I know is missing in here. Okay. It's missing in here, not up here. Next Saturday, we need to remember to spring forward. We lose an hour next weekend. So, before you go to bed, so you're not late for church the next day, set your box ahead one hour. If you rely on your cell phone like I do, it does it for you. So, it, it's pretty quick and easy that way. So, uh, don't forget to do that. And then, then now we can talk about Iron Sharpens Iron. This will replace our April men's breakfast. We will be taking off for Davenport, probably, let's see here, yeah, 6 30, 7 o'clock. <laughs> <laughs> just to make it down there in time. Um, but right now, I think we have eight or nine folks signed up. If we can get one more and get to that 10, we can get the uh, discounted price. So looking forward to everyone joining us for that. And then for those of you that are online, uh, Diane's getting ready to, as she's posting all these announcements up for me. Uh, she's going to be putting in today's worship set list for you so that you can worship along after we uh, close down the online portion of the service. That's a lot. If you didn't catch all of it, Facebook, our website, everything is all out there so that you can catch up on that. Well, this morning, our call to worship comes from John chapter 16, verse 33. And this is Jesus speaking. He says, I have told you all this so you may have peace in me. Yep, it is different, and it's probably going to be different slide here. So, in the middle of the night last night, I got <laughs> As I was finishing up, I did change it. forgot to update that. I actually remembered the communion slide this week, but forgot to change the call to worship. But, John 16, verse 33, says, I have told you all this so that you may have peace in me. Here on earth you may have many trials and sorrows, but take heart. I have overcome the world. As Christians, we are going to go through storms in our lives because ultimately the world is out of sync with Christ. This is what this verse is telling us, is that the world is out of sync 
with Jesus. And these words from Jesus are not meant to chastise us. They're not meant to say, oh, you're all, you're all messed up, you're out of sync, you're going to have a bunch of trials, a bunch of sorrows. That's not the point. It was The point of it was to bring us comfort. In, 14, in chapter 14, verse 27, uh, Jesus promised peace. And in 16, 20, and 22, he promised joy. And this is kind of that culmination of all these things that he had been saying. And while we may be out of sync with the world, see how I changed that? The world's out of sync with Jesus, but we as Christians are out of sync with the world. We are in, please don't think of an new thing. We are in sync <laughs> with Jesus. It's because of our relationship with him that we can know his comfort and peace. And we can know that Jesus will never leave us in our storms. And that leads us into the sermon this morning in the second of our ser uh, six sermon series, Following Jesus in Your Storms. And so there is that's so important that we follow him. And we're going to talk about what that looks like. Now, now we're going to talk about Mark chapter 4. And I'm pretty sure this one's in, the, in there correctly. There we go. And so we're going to break this passage down into two pieces. First, we're going to talk about verses 35 through 37. And then here in a little bit, we'll finish up 38 through 41. But in this first part, it says, As evening came, Jesus said to his disciples, Let's cross to the other side of the lake. So they took Jesus in the boat and started out, leaving the crowds behind, although other boats followed. And as I was reading this, and I was studying this, and all I can think of is, this is like the paparazzi following around a, a star, right? You know, they, they, they hopped in their own boats and they went after him. But soon a fierce storm came up. High waves were breaking into the boat, and it began to fill with water. <coughs> they had come into a sudden storm. And when I think about that, I, the question pops into my mind. It says, where are you at today? What storm is brewing in your life? Or is it a sunny day like it is today? Or was it like yesterday, where it started off and it was all dreary and then it rained and then the sun came out and then what happened again the clouds came back in is it what does that look like for you now thankfully some of life's storms like the rain yesterday are short while others seem to just drag on and on and on in our call to worship we heard about hope and even in the midst of those trials and those sorrows. And these storms, these things that come into our life can pop up out of absolutely nowhere. Or they can seemingly pop up out of nowhere. You ever look back at a storm in your life going, oh yeah, I should have seen that coming. And that's what can happen. But uh, I want to talk about uh, the boat that they're in first and then we'll talk about the storm because we actually know what that boat looked like or could have looked like because back in 1986 <coughs> just a little bit ago in the mud on the northwest shore of the Sea of Galilee they found a boat it measured 26 and a half feet long seven and a half feet wide and four and a half feet deep and it had an elevated stern which allowed it to carry up to 15 people so let's see disciples jesus <coughs> hey they didn't overload the boat that's a good start but now we know or have an idea of what that boat looked like i couldn't find one because i really wanted to throw it up on the screen of what that boat looked like for you 
but it's just so interesting and we've talked about this whether it was truth project or as any number of our other uh, series of uh, bible studies that we've done where the things that we are finding prove the story of the bible to be true now let's get back to that storm so here's the thing with that storm it wasn't unusual for the Sea of Galilee. And now, just to be sure that everyone understands, if you hear it referred to as Lake Tiberias, they're one and the same. And it was low-lying and surrounded by hills. Now, you can get an idea of what that looks like right here in this picture. Low-lying, high hills. But there's another piece to this. We sit at about 800 feet above sea level here in Iowa. That's, that sea is 680 feet below sea level. So that causes for some additional things. The water can be very warm, especially certain times of the year. When you get that cold wind blowing in off of those hills. Two air masses hit, what happens? Hot and cold. We have a bad storm. So it, it was nothing for that to mix together and result in a very violent storm with waves upwards of 10 feet or more. Now, I've shrunk, so I'm no longer six feet, but <laughs> I'm thinking like almost to the ceiling here. And it came in quickly. In our study guide for this Wednesday, it puts it this way, the atmospheric <laughs> conditions of this fallen world create a low pressure system that generates struggles, stress, challenges. So when you think about how quickly a storm can roll in and how much damage it can do, I'm immediately transported back two and a half years, August 10th, 2020, when that derecho hit. Uh, most of you know I work for a cell phone company on the phones as a technician, and I was on the phone with one of our stores, and it went literally, I mean, I've got those accordion shades in the basement, so I can't see out, but I went from having nice light similar to this to pitch black, and then I heard the whistling sound. I'm telling the story, I think, at the time, we actually had our cell phones hooked up to our computers, mm -hmm. and so I could walk away from my desk. I said, while we're waiting for this order to complete, I'm gonna take you on a little trip. We're gonna go look out my back window, sliding the door and see what's going on. <laughs> and so we walked out, and I'm looking, and it's like, yeah, I'm glad I'm going on break right after I get done with you. And no sooner had I hung up with him and gone on break, and the lights went out for two, what, 12 days, 11 days, something yeah. like that. Yeah, depending on where you were and how much damage you got, because you guys had d damage too. I mean, it's it was just that. And it's like that. It, this shows how fast a storm in our lives can come in. Because that storm lasted, what, all of the 140-mile-an-hour winds were about 30 minutes and over 100 for about an hour. Yep. So an hour. And we've got damage that's still being picked up today. So that's how quickly a storm can move into our life, throw it into turmoil, and leave, and it leaves you right there. Now here we're getting to the second part of this passage. And it's, it just reminds me of people. People see Jesus as a non-participant in their lives when storms come into their lives. So as we look at this passage, verse 38 says, Jesus was sleeping at the back of the boat with his head on a cushion. Can you imagine? Boats t being tossed all over the place. Mm -hmm. Well, I actually can because back in high school, I would fall asleep on the school bus when we were going to a competition or something. And uh, yeah, I'd wake up with my shoelaces tied to the <laughs> seat post and makeup because the girls thought that was hilarious. So did the guys. Walked into a jazz band competition fingernails and everything. <laughs> Fortunately, the bathroom was right inside the door and I was able to get cleaned up. But 
I could understand how he could sleep through that. But the disciples, they woke him up shouting, Teacher, don't you care that we're going to drown? When Jesus woke up, he rebuked the wind and he said to the waves, Silence, be still. And suddenly the wind stopped and there was a great calm. Then he asked them, Why are you afraid? Do you still have no faith? Jesus is thinking, you guys have been with me how long now? And you still didn't know what I could do? The disciples were absolutely terrified. These are guys that were fishermen. They fished on this, this lake. They knew the storms. They'd probably been in them before. So this one had to be a little bit extra. Who is this man? And then they finish this passage and says, Even the wind and waves obey him. It goes back to what I said. People see Jesus as a non-participant in their lives. They wonder if he's going to get them through. There is doubt. This is a reminder that we have to keep our eyes focused on Jesus. focused on Jesus, then we are finding Jesus in the storm. Now, I talked to some of the guys yesterday about this, and, and so for the viewer of Men's Breakfast, is a little bit of a rehash of a story, but this past week I found myself more shaken to the core at work than I had ever been. I've been verbally attacked at work, but I have never had my life, my family's life, and the lives of the people in that local store where this person lived threatened. I had every right. And he said, <laughs> this person said, you're going to hang up on me, I know it. <clears throat> and I had every right to. Because <clears throat> at that moment, in the back of my mind, at the core of my soul, I I literally looked up and said, really? <laughs> but here's the, here's the thing. I fixed the problem. Uh, that was, in and of itself, was like, whew. But we ended up bonding over a few things. Believe it or not, this guy's threading me in my life. And we ended up bonding over nursing homes, neuropathy, Gabapentin, tramadol, and family. Now, my dad has neuropathy. He takes gabapentin and he takes tramadol. And he's family. And he's in assisted living. I have some onset neuropathy in my feet. So I have a little bit of an idea. I could sort of. He said he started talking about this laundry list of things that causes him to just go off the deep end. And I grabbed onto one of those because I was told to. And we bonded over it. Here's what ended up happening. At the end of the call, I get an apology. He tells me I'm a good man. Fix the phone. But he would not let me off the phone until I said, kept saying, you need to tell me that you are a good man. I said, I am. And he said, no, you have to say the words. I, I finally said the words. And I saw Jesus in that storm. You know what? I started my day in the Word. I prayed over the people I would be speaking with that day. And I could stay focused on him throughout. So let's talk about focus a little bit. Let's go to Matthew chapter 14, starting at verse 22. Immediately after this, Jesus insisted that his disciples get back into the boat and cross to the other side of the lake while he sent the people home. This is after 
he had just fed thousands. After sending them home, he went up into the hills by himself to pray. Night fell while he was there alone. Meanwhile, the disciples were in trouble far away from land, for a strong wind had arisen, and they were fighting heavy waves. Sounds familiar, doesn't it? About three o'clock in the morning, Jesus came toward them walking on the water. When the disciples saw him walking on the water, they were terrified. In their fear, they cried out, It's a ghost! Can you imagine Jesus walking to you on the water like that? <laughs> but Jesus spoke to them at once and said, Don't be afraid. Take courage. I am here. Then Peter called to him, Lord, if it's really you, tell me to come to you walking on the water. Yes. Come. Can you? And I'm sure he said it much louder than that because of the waves and the crashing and everything. Yes, come, Jesus said. So Peter went over the side of the boat and walked on the water toward Jesus. But when he saw the strong wind and the waves, he was terrified and began to sink. Save me, Lord, he shouted. Jesus immediately reached out and grabbed him. You have so little faith, Jesus said. Why did you doubt me? Didn't he just say that? Why are you afraid? Do you still have? When they climbed back into the boat, the wind stopped. Then the disciples worshipped him. You really are the Son of God, they exclaimed. What did this passage begin with? After he had sent them on their way, he said, I need you to go do this, so go. And then he went and spent time with the Father. Just a bit teaching just provided a meal for thousands. I'm guessing he's probably pretty tired, but he made time and room for God, which I'm guessing he did in the morning and throughout the course of the day as well. It doesn't say that, but Jesus' actions throughout the scriptures dictate that he would have done that. And when we do this, then we are nurturing the very most important relationship in our lives. It equips us to meet the challenges and struggles of life head on. We are then prepared to see Jesus in the storm. And Jesus sees that the disciples are in trouble, just like he sees when we're in trouble. He saw that the disciples were in trouble, so he, what, he just, in Jesus' fashion, just walked down the beach and kept on going. Walk towards him. And Peter's response when he realized who it was had to have been one of the most impulsive requests. Lord, if it's really you, tell me to come to you walking on the water. Kind of like when they went to the trans during the transfiguration, <laughs> they wanted to make a, a meal and, and set up shelter. They just I guess the term today is word vomit, but it just, it just came out. Interestingly enough, if you, when you read this, G, uh, Peter's not putting God to the test. He's reacting in faith. But his requests will allow him to experience God's power in a very unusual way. No one before or since has ever walked on water, humanly speaking. Now, yeah, you see people do magic and stuff. And, you know, there's that clear piece of plastic that's just under the water or whatever that they're walking on. It doesn't really happen. But in this instance, he truly was walking on the water because as soon as he saw the waves crashing and heard them crashing, what did he do? He took his focus off of Jesus. In our storms, we can do the same thing. We take our eyes off Jesus, and everything seems to start to fall apart. We metaphorically start to sink. Do 
it would have been so easy during that call for me to take my eyes off Jesus and hang up on that guy and pray for the next person that had to talk to him. Because he was going to call back. But like Peter, we all do this. We start off with those good intentions. Peter's good intention was to walk to Jesus, keeping his eyes on him. But sometimes we waver. Now, does that mean we failed? Absolutely not. Absolutely not. We have to do what Peter did. Recognize what's happening. And reach out to the Savior who is reaching down for us. Again, this is why it's so important for us to prepare. When we find Jesus in the storm, it's because we've opened our eyes and realized that he's been there the whole time whole time reaching down to us. So what do the storms reveal? Sometimes the storms in our lives are of our, are of our own making. <clears throat> they are the consequences of our mm -hmm. own actions. What storms have you gone through? Then what storms have you gone through that God has set you on that path. Remember, Jesus told them to get in the boat and go to the other side. He started them on that path. Why would God intentionally lead us down a path where we would have a storm, or storms, plural? Well, think about the passage from Matthew 14. That we just went through. In verse 22 it says immediately after this Jesus insisted that his disciples get back in the boat and cross the other side of the lake while he sent the people home. And he did not go immediately to them because they were already gone. He would, They would assume he'd get in another boat and follow after them. While they were being tossed about it likely led them to the same questions that we ask when we are in our storms. <clears throat> Why did God allow this to happen? Why am I having to go through this? Just right there, I'm going to stop right there before I get to that last question because I can remember, and I've said, probably said this before, I can remember when Marissa's mom or no, no back up, when my first wife left me, I sat on the floor playing solitaire, asking God those very questions. Why did you do this to me? Yeah, I get on the other side of it, hindsight 2020, and I'm looking at it going, oh yeah, I did this, she did that. Okay. We're both responsible. But then we get to the point, like the disciples, where God told them to do something. So why did God tell me to do this. You know, when we think about why God tells us to do things, Diane said, hey, did you check your Facebook memories this morning? I said, no, not yet. Two years ago, we had this big announcement on our Facebook page and on our website and everything else saying, we've moved. That was to our last location. <laughs> we've moved. And then some things happened and we needed to move again and we came here and this space while it doesn't cost a whole lot more than our previous space towards us a lot more space God allows us to do so many things but there's also a commitment behind it a three-year commitment that there's a responsibility So as the church doesn't necessarily grow as fast as we want it to, Mark and I can sometimes be sitting and talking as when we're meeting going, yeah, what's going on? <laughs> Why are we not growing? Why did God lead us down this path? There's more to it. And there may be several more questions that pop into your heads and, and make you think about what's happening in your storm. But what happened when Jesus got into the boat? When they allowed Jesus?
as this end of the boat, the wind stopped. It doesn't even say in this passage that he commanded it to stop. It just stopped. Before this point, certainly the disciples had been in awe of Jesus. And they were amazed by the things he had done. But this is the first time in the book of Matthew, as we read through all the things that they did with him, that they stopped and worshipped him. You really are the Son of God. They finally had seen Jesus for who he truly is, and that he is worthy of worship. Now, yes, it is hard to understand the purpose of the storms that God allows us to go through, especially we're in the middle of them. But how about this? As each storm that we go through prepares us for the next one. And not only that, it prepares us to come along some I, someone else who is maybe going through the same storm that you have already been through, allowing you to minister to them. Yesterday, uh, Dallas joined us, and we haven't seen Dallas for uh, a couple of years, two, three years. Dallas came in, and he, he had just come from a Bible study at the church that he's going to. He wanted to fellowship with other men. And he told us some things. He's grown spiritually. He works in a big box store, we'll just leave it at that, in a big box store, and you know what he does? He talks to his co-workers about Jesus, unapologetically and without fear of his job. He's taking some of the storms that he's been through in his past and using them to minister to the other people around him. So that leads us to our next point about keeping your focus. Let's face it. We live in a world that has, and this is at least for me, so I'm, I, I'm not going to speak generally for everybody, but it has stolen my ability to stay focused on anything that takes more than a few minutes. <laughs> These things are constantly buzzing, dinging, or whatever else you have it set up for when a notification comes in. Emails, texts, social media, whatever it is. They have so many of us looking at our phones to see what's happening. Now, yesterday at men's breakfast, I sat about where Doug is, uh, with, around the table, and I had set my phone back where Diane is. I separated myself from the phone. I did not get up at all to go pick it up or look at it. Pretty good, huh? I even had a vibrate. It was all good. But I have this thing, a smartwatch. So what does it do when a notification goes off on my phone? It, I'm at rest. Oh, what's going on? Oh, ESPN's live. Who cares? Um, that's what it does, though. It draws your attention away. It pulls you out of where you're at. And honestly, I should have shut those notifications off coming to my watch. But. I, like a lot of people in this world, suffer from what the world calls FOMO. If you don't know what FOMO is, it's four letters that mean fear of missing out. The distractions in our lives are very real and they can be overpowering. Who has ever pulled up Facebook or Instagram or TikTok or whatever and all of a sudden you're wrapped up in the reels or the videos? And it's, you know, 3 o'clock, and pretty soon it's 7.30. Where did that four and a half hours just disappear to? What could we have done in that four and a half hours? They are very overpowering, and our minds, because of this, this way that our world has gone, our minds are constantly racing and going from one thing to the next. To make things worse... We often turn to these distractions to numb our emotions while we try to weather a storm. Now, unfortunately, uh, last night, 
or not last night, the night before last, right? It was Friday night that Jeff passed? Yesterday. Yesterday? Yesterday morning. Okay. One of the guys at the, the shelter was found at the shelter and he had died. He was using a specific distraction, an addiction, to numb his emotions or whatever was going on in his life. There's a lot of people out there like that. It doesn't necessarily have to be alcohol or drugs. It can be just about anything. But we use those to numb our emotions while we try to numb the storm. Now, other times, we tend to look at these distractions as a way to find help or guidance. So, a little PSA this morning, public service announcement. These things do not provide any help or any guidance unless you're calling your counselor. But it's common to hear people say that they are tired and they no longer want to adult because adulting, that, this new word, adulting is hard. I don't want to call the doctor. Kind of need to call. And I'm just as guilty as anyone else. Earlier in our passage from Matthew 14, we hear Peter boldly request, Lord, if it's really you, tell me to come to you walking on the water. When Jesus told him to come, Peter did it. And he was doing it. Can you imagine being that focused on Jesus all the time? <clears throat> not just for a moment, not just for a few minutes, but all the time. But we do what, Je what Peter did, and we tend to take our eyes off Jesus and we start to sing. It's hard. It is so hard to stay focused. And when I was writing this, I, I was writing um, in my quiet time this morning. Well, that was again this morning. And two days ago and a week ago, I'm reading my Bible, praying not a storm in sight, but what happens? I don't mind just saying stick a stroll somewhere else. I'm reading the words in the Bible, but my mind is trailing off somewhere else. Now, some of those things may be important, most of them not. And when I realize what's happening, I get frustrated. I get mad at myself, and then you got to back up. Where was it that I last remember consciously reading? Metaphorically, we are battling those waves, desperately trying to paddle to shore. And instead of being guided by Jesus, we are being led by fear, anxiety, and countless other emotions. And like Peter, we forget that Jesus is greater than the storm. In the Old Testament, when asked, God says, I am. Well, Jesus is the I am. You know how I know that? I know that because John tells us that in John chapter 1, verses 1 and 5, when he says, in the beginning, the Word already existed. The Word was with God, and the Word was God. He existed in the beginning with God, and God created everything through Him. And nothing was created except through Him. The Word gave life to everything that was created, and His life brought light to everyone. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness can never extinguish it. Jesus was there in the beginning. Nothing was created without him being there. So we know that God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit were all together at the very beginning. So when Jesus, in stating that Jesus is the I Am, he is. Jesus is also our courage and our strength, our hope and our peace. company that I work for, the cell phone company that I carry that I work for, is doing a campaign right now talking about putting it down for five. And they're saying, whether that's five minutes, five hours, or five days, put it down. Talking about, I mean, we, that's our bread and butter. But we want people to connect. Because that is important. It's part of our culture at work. 
So put down the phone, turn off that computer, take your eyes off the distractions of life and see Jesus for who he is. Reach for him the same way that Peter did. And we have this example. I mean, Hebrews 11, we call that the faith chapter. There's all these things about the, all these people that were focused on God. And in chapter 12, 1 and 3, it says, Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a huge crowd of witnesses to the life of faith, let us strip off every weight that slows us down, especially the sin that so easily trips us up. And let us run with endurance the race God has set before us. We do this by keeping our eyes on Jesus, the champion who initiates and perfects our faith. Because of the joy awaiting him, he endured the cross, regarding its shame or disregarding its shame. Now he is seated in the place of honor beside God's throne. Think of all the hostility he endured from simple people. Then you won't become weary and give up. That crowd of witnesses, they're just like us. We get, they got distracted. They did, they had their own stories, but they are a witness to how we can reach back out and have God do mighty things. Jesus, and then it talks about how he endured it for all of us. Sin, past, present, and future. People, past, present, and future. When we focus on, and we remember what they did, we focus on Jesus, then we will not become wearier, we won't want to give up, and we will have found peace in the storm. When Jesus stepped into the boat, the wind stopped. But that wasn't the only time that happened. We go back to Mark 4, where we started with. The disciples, in both cases, were battling a storm, and Jesus, in the, in the first one, he was sleeping in the back of the boat. He was there. And when they woke him, the wind stopped. There are times when Jesus does that with our storms. He's there, but he's so long as to go through that storm. But he can and does miraculously bring peace, healing, and restoration. <clears throat> Other times, he offers us peace, not just during the storm, but through the storm, even though the storm is still raging around us. It's a peace that he offers despite the storm even if it carries on. Problems persist, whether it's illnesses lingering or issues remaining unresolved. Jesus is still there. The old saying goes, the teacher is always silent during the test. The peace we get in these situations is an inner peace that he is there. When my ex-wife took our daughter and disappeared out of state for four years, I had gotten past that point where I was playing solitaire and asking God why. And he gave me a peace that got me through four very long years. Very, four very important years. have to realize that he's there and stop looking for that peace in other places. We're not going to find that peace in money. You're not going to find it by changing your friends or by big, getting a bigger house, a fancier car, or whatever. On and on goes that list. But have you ever noticed that when you're not focused on Jesus, and if the storm does pass, another one immediately takes its place. The only cure for this is the peace of God. It's not a material thing, it's a state of mind. It's like that still, small voice that I heard on that call. That still, small voice was an inner peace that was not going get me anywhere else but peace
peace with the situation. It's something that only comes through God through a relationship with Jesus. Let's pray. Father, teach us to trust you through life's storms. As we look back on the storms of life, let us see each time that we have encountered you. And let us be thankful that you are always there. Forgive us for getting so distracted and help us to turn from those distractions. Let us look to you instead of our phones or our computers or whatever else that we are using as a surrogate for you and that we're trying to use to calm our fears and anxieties. For it's only you, Lord, who are able to do that. Only you are reaching out your hand to us. And it is only by reaching back out to you that we will know that inner peace. Thank you for pulling us up when we are sinking in our storms. Thank you for the peace that only you can give. In Jesus' name. time of inner peace that Jesus was getting because of his relationship with the Father when he had a meal with his Father and his disciples. On the screen you see Luke twenty two nineteen, and he took bread and gave thanks for it and broke it and gave it unto them saying this is my body which is given for you. This do in remembrance of me. A little bit later in the meal, he took the cup and after having filled it, said, this is the cup of the new covenant, my blood shed for the sins of many. Take and drink. The scripture reminds us that as often as we do this, we do so in remembrance of Jesus and we also do it until he body of Christ. The blood of Christ shed for you. Take and drink. Father, thank you for what this meal represents and that each time we do it is a reminder of how connected we are with you, Father, that your hand reaches down, we are reaching up. You are always there for us. Let us not forget that. In Jesus' name. Amen. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. It's great to see everyone this morning. So we have a few people to pray for. For the people, so if anyone would like to ask for prayers, let me just uh, yes, Jane. For Jenna, she will be leaving for Hawaii and South America on Tuesday, and she's going over there for uh, guidance in her ministry, joining a, joining a prayer group over there in Hawaii oh, wow. to help her with her journey okay. for, for safe travel. <laughs> So they've taken him, he's been sick for like two weeks. Really? And they've taken him to the doctor, the hospital. They thought mm -hmm. maybe as of yesterday it was mm -hmm. stripped out near infection. But when my son texted me, he said he's still pretty sick. Okay. Mm -hmm. And then Debbie and I's friend, uh, Jeff Hanover, that Jeff Hanover guy passed away. at the shelter. Please go. 
going in for his shoulder surgery this week too. He's having his full shoulder replaced, so we're gonna pray for that too. Okay, well, Father God, we come to you this morning with praise and honor, and we thank you for all things. We give you all the glory for being our guiding light every day, and even in the darkest hours of our lives, for granting second chances for those who have lost hope. In 1 Peter 2, 24, 25, he himself bore our sins in his body on the tree so that we might die to sin and live for righteousness. By his wounds you have been healed, for you were, you were like sheep going astray, but now you have returned to the shepherd and the overseer of your souls. Father God, we are here this morning to lift up those in need, and we ask humbly that you hear our prayer this morning, Lord, for I am as nothing, and I just thank you for my life and putting me at, here at this time, and I am honored to pray for all these people, Lord Jesus. Give me the words to speak, that you will honor that. First, we lift up my friend's niece, Marissa, who had the heart transplant at 21 and now is in serious trouble with her body <laughs> rejecting this heart. I thank you, God, that you heard our prayer last week, for we have good news of her improvement. The doctors were able to remove her ventilator and some other equipment she has been hooked up to for quite some time now. And the new medication is helping. Her body is um, quit rejecting her heart. And we thank you, Jesus, for that. We pray for continued healing and that the blood of Jesus wash over her and take any infection away from her. Let her body not reject this heart you gave her, Lord Jesus, for someone else had to die in order for her to have this heart and to live. And we just pray that for, for Marissa today, Lord. And let Marissa's life that you have given her give glory and honor to you for her healing. And we thank you, Jesus. What a mighty God we serve. We thank you, Father God, for the healing of Diane's hand, and we give you all the honor and praise, for there is no end to your mighty power. You are the great physician, and we praise and honor you today. We thank you for Atlas and Kim and John, and we pray for healing for all of them, Lord God. We pray for healing of the illness that Atlas and Kim have and the illness that Lucia Luciano is, is now suffering as well. We pray for healing for all of them, Lord God. We pray for continued healing for John's shoulder, Lord Jesus. And um, we just ask that you cover them with your, with your grace and your mercies you each day, and you give them healing in their body, Lord Jesus. We pray for um, Jenna, who is going to Hawaii and South America join a prayer group and we pray that um, your Holy Spirit will be within their prayer group Lord and you will give them guidance and, and discernment as to what to do what to say and who to talk to and and um, and how to minister to these people Lord that they will have a renewed relationship with you Father God we pray for uh, travel mercies for Mark keep him safe wherever he may go bring him back safely to us for he is a great minister, Lord. And we thank you for Terry, who ministers today, and we just thank you for his words and his, his blessing to us, Lord Jesus. We um, pray for Tim and Angela Casey, for they lost their mother last week. Lord God, just watch over them and keep them safe. Give them, um, give them peace in their lives, Lord Jesus. And also the people um, for Doug and Monica, who lost Jeff Hanover today, Lord God, just be with those people at this shelter. Give them hope for a new tomorrow. Help them to know that you are God, and there is hope in their lives that they do not have to suffer like Jeff did. Just um, be with them and comfort them as they go through this time in their lives, Lord. Father God, I lift up Sarah Sinclair and Larry Westerhoff and Lori's friend Dave. You alone are our shelter healer and mighty tower, our refuge in times of great illness. Help them to know they are loved, even in their darkest hours. Help them not to give up hope, for hope gives us courage to get through each new day. Walk with them on their journeys through this life and each new trial they face. 
each new hurdle they must take, Lord God, help them to trust in you and your unfailing love. And Father God, I lift up my husband, Steve, as he will be having a complete shoulder replacement on Tuesday. I pray the Holy Spirit to be in that surgery room, to guide the doctor's hands, to do their best job, so that he will be completely restored of the use of his arm and from the pain he has endured for so many months. Please let the healing pain be minimal and give us both courage to face each new day through the healing process that he must go through. We honor you, Father God, with all that will be done. And Father God, I lift up those unspoken prayer requests for people in the room and online. I ask that you hear their cries for healing, listen to their worries and their needs, and those seeking that personal relationship with you, Jesus. Help them to seek you out by reading your word to guide them through this life. For by your blood shed on the cross for many, and by the reading of your word, they can and will be healed. If we ask, if we seek, if we knock, the door will be open to an amazing life with Christ Jesus, our Lord and Savior. And we thank you in the precious name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. As we prepare to close out our online portion of our service, prompted by the Spirit to continue to pray each week this prayer. In fact, I pray this prayer every single day, and we've sent it out on social media and an email, but if you don't have it or you'd like a physical copy of this, on the table there is a copy for you. Lord God in heaven, I pray for you to move against the forces of evil. Lord God, I ask that by your mighty power that you would bind Satan and all of his minions from every aspect of our lives as well as those of our families and our church family. In your mighty name, Lord Jesus, bind all the forces of darkness and disband them with your light. Throw the enemy forces into confusion, hampering their plans and shutting down their schemes so that they will not prosper in their rebellion against you and we, your people. I pray that any and all support of those who do evil in your sight would be dissolved. I pray that their hard hearts would be softened, and they would turn to you, Father God, and that they would be made right in your sight through the salvation that comes through accepting Jesus as their Lord and Savior. Heavenly Father, let us have eyes to see past the deception of the enemy, and instead of rebellion, there would be repentance. Draw us ever closer to you, Father. Open our eyes to see that you are the King of kings, the Lord of hosts, the commander of heaven's army the Most High God. Lord, send your warning, warring and protecting angels to surround us and protect us from all evil. I pray that all the forces of evil that are working against the efforts of Grace Street Church, our church family and their friends and family would be bound away and that they would be overcome by your mighty power. Lord Jesus, we claim this as a victory in your name. And we know that by calling on your name that you will protect us. All glory, honor, and praise to you forever and ever. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, and all God's people said, Amen. Amen. And it's this priestly blessing that I send you out with. May the Lord bless you and protect you. May the Lord smile on you and be gracious to you. May the Lord show you his favor and give you 